Can I invite you to stand? So let us call one another to worship. Listen, God's voice calls us. We hear God calling. Look, God will provide for us. We see Christ working in our midst. Come, God is making us holy. We welcome the Spirit's power. We sing together, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of the prophets, priests and rulers who have gone before, we come into your home today, having heard your voice. In every age you have called your people into community, welcoming saint and sinner alike into the household of faith. Anoint us now with your presence. Rush into our midst on spirit wings. Establish your reign in our hearts. 
all-seeing God, you see us as we are, as wayward sheep, well-meaning yet weak, valued and loved yet fearful. All loving God, we are short-sighted, valuing appearances, shallow in our judgments, selective in our neighbourliness. All merciful God, forgive and free us, for we long to see with your eyes, to know ourselves and our neighbours through the eyes of love. In the name of Christ, who sees who loves, who forgives us all, we pray. Amen. And we join together in the words of prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, it is my delight to welcome you to worship this morning here at Bloomsbury, and uh, a welcome also to those who are joining us online through Zoom, through Facebook Live, and maybe if you're catching up with us during the week on YouTube. We gather in such ways, and it is good that we're able to gather in the presence of God. So you are particularly welcome. My name is Simon. I'm one of the ministers here at Bloomsbury. Uh, my colleague Dawn, our communities minister, is at the back. And if you don't know Dawn and I, we'd be delighted to get to know you after the service. Uh, and we're going to have uh, a number of other people participating in worship today. I think Libby and Howard are bringing us our readings and Tommaso down the line from Italy will be bringing us our prayers later. And we welcome Philip as a musician. So thank you, Philip, for all your ministry to us as well. But now I'm going to ask Nigel, our church secretary, to come and bring us our notices. Good morning, and I add my welcome to Simon's words. Um, so this afternoon, members of a minded, we have our AGM. That's at 2 p.m. here in the church. So do hang around and share lunch together or go out very quickly for lunch in order to be back on time for that. Two o'clock here in the church. On Friday, it's the 60th anniversary of when Martin Luther King preached here at Bloomsbury, the first time he preached in the UK, was at this church, and there is a, a day of talks and events to celebrate that. So at 2pm, there's a series of talks about that, 2pm here in the church, and then in the evening at 7 o'clock, and during that, we're going to hear part of the sermon. I don't think it's an actual recording, but is it a... It's a recording of him preaching the same sermon he preached here, but it was made about three months after, so it's not a recording. It is there you go. So come and hear his voice in the church saying what he said here. So that's at 7 p.m. So you can check the details out on the website. You can register on Eventbrite, but you can just turn up as well, I think. Uh, two weeks today, Simon still has some complimentary tickets for the British Museum. That's for the Peru exhibition. Uh, on the afternoon of Sunday, the 7th of November. So please see Simon if you'd like to go along with him for that. I've been to some of these exposition, ex exhibitions. They're very good and they're free, which is also very good. And just looking forward a few weeks, on the 21st of November, we have a memorial service for Chris Green, our former member, and he uh, that service will be at 2 p.m. on the 21st of November. And the following week, there's another memorial service for Florence Finch, also at 2 p.m. So that's on the 28th. Thank you. We're now going to sing, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord.
Good morning. Our first reading is from the first book of Samuel, chapter 16, reading from verses 1 to 13. <clears throat> the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. <clears throat> Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint to me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he, sacrificed, and he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortal sees. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord says, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. The choir, I think, have an anthem for us.
Thank you very much to our choir. And now uh, I'm reading from Psalm 51, starting at uh, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. And then in the book of James, uh, fourth chapter and starting at verse seven. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Amen. And now Simon will give our sermon. I was in a meeting this week with others from London Citizens, and we were discussing the fact that it is only just over six months before the next round of UK local elections. With all London boroughs, councils, and all local authorities up for election on the 22nd of May, 2022. The opportunities for electing our leaders only happen uh, periodically sporadically and it always represents an opportunity to bring about change which can be change in the direction of justice. This will be our country's first chance since the pandemic to choose who our local leaders will be and I wonder what our criteria will be when we come to vote. Will we simply vote for the local representatives of our preferred national party? Or will we engage deeply with the people, the policies and the programmes that will shape our society over the next few years? With COP26 around the corner, you might want to take a look at the website of The Commitment UK, who invite us to make a commitment to voting with the health of the planet at the heart of your decision. They will then take everyone's commitment to the local politicians giving those local politicians a powerful reason to state that they will act on the climate and the natural world, because of course the politicians really want our votes. The months in the run up to an election are a key time to obtain promises from those seeking office as they develop their policies to win confidence and of course, ultimately votes. We saw this with the London mayoral election earlier this year, and a number of us from Bloomsbury joined with thousands of others for an online citizens' assembly to put to the mayoral candidates a manifesto of requests on the issues that we believe matter most to London. So we got promises on housing and homelessness, on youth safety and knife crime, on the living wage, on welcome and sanctuary for refugees, and on a just transition to becoming a carbon neutral city. This last one continues to resonate, of course, with the threat of rising utility prices pushing more people into fuel poverty, where they have to choose between heating their homes and buying food. And the task is now on to hold our elected mayor to account on the promises he gave. And I'm personally involved with this along with some others from Bloomsbury. And if you're not involved and you want to be involved, talk to me about how that can happen. At the Deacons meeting this week, uh, Jean mentioned the proud history this church has of taking action on issues of justice. 
And actually, uh, Jean and myself and Liz and, and my mum went on a, a fair trade walk around London yesterday afternoon. It was advertised in uh, the news sheet for a couple of weeks. Um, it was great. We discovered so much about London's history of engaging with issues of justice as a city. And if anyone would like to join me on the uh, evening of Monday the 15th of November, I'm going to an event organised by our West London Citizens Group that will be highlighting the importance of both the living wage and the necessity to create good green jobs. And we'll be joined by a representative from the Mayor's Office who will be speaking about the progress they've made since the election and we'll be getting to meet both employers seeking to create good job opportunities and also local people who are seeking fair employment. Again, do let me know if you'd like to join me and Libby will send the information on all this around in the news email this week. And if you don't yet get the news email, talk to me or to Libby and we'll be delighted to add you to that email mailer. All of which illustrates my point for this morning, which is that who we have as our leaders really matters. And this is true nationally, it is true internationally, it is true locally, and it is true in church life. Who we have as our leaders really matters. As I said last week, it isn't true that all politicians are the same, any more than it is true that all church leaders are the same. And all leaders, even those with whom we may disagree on policy, are, I think, worthy of respect until they prove otherwise. And so we come to the story we had read to us earlier from the book of 1 Samuel, which speaks powerfully, I think, to our current situation. You may remember the story so far. Israel under the judges had become lawless and godless, a place where, as Judges 17 puts it, Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And God's answer to this degeneration of the national uh, sense of ethics was to call Samuel, the young boy who would be God's prophet to the nation, calling Israel to a better way of being. Those who suggest that religion should stay away from politics obviously haven't spent enough time reading the Hebrew Bible, because it is clear from the stories such as the life of Samuel that God's people absolutely have a vital role to play in the way society is shaped and functions. And this week we rejoin the story of Samuel. A few chapters later, we, we join him now as an adult, whereas last week we were with him as a child, just beginning to sense God's call. Now we find him stepping into his vocation as the person who is called to lead the people of Israel from this time of degeneracy and corruption into a new and better future as a society. And he finds himself representing the bright new hope for the nation which is the popular call for the establishment of a monarchy. The people are crying out that the judges have failed them and that what they need now is a king, just like all the other nations have. In this, we hear, I think, an early example of nationalist politics. And the parallels with certain contemporary political events are too obvious to ignore. The people of Israel felt failed by the political system of the judges, which had become bureaucratic and unwieldy and corruption had become a constant threat and the judges as leaders were out of touch with the people. And so the people cried out for a new national identity, a new way of understanding who they were. They wanted to take their stand on the world stage, on an equal basis to the other countries around them. Does it sound familiar? Instead of Brexit, of course, they wanted a king. 
It's interesting to note that Samuel was far from being an ardent advocate for the monarchy. Samuel had profound doubts about whether kingship was a path that Israel ought to be following. But Israel wanted its king, a bright, shining personality of a leader who would fix all their problems and be accountable to those who appointed this king. And initially, of course, it looked like Saul was the perfect choice. He was every inch a king, but also, it emerged, brutal, faithless and unpredictable. And by the time we rejoin this story in chapter 16, we find Samuel embroiled in another attempt to raise up a new leadership, this time against the backdrop of the failing leadership of Saul, rather than the previously failing regime of the judges. And so Samuel goes to Bethlehem to visit a man called Jesse, because God has told Samuel that the next king will be one of Jesse's sons. As a leadership appointment strategy, I think it lacks some of the nuances of contemporary democracy. But then sometimes I look at who democracy appoints as our leader and I wonder whether things are really all that different. Anyway, Samuel sets up this kind of beauty pageant parade of potential kings. And his first instinct is for a young man called Eliab. However, as Samuel had already discovered with Saul, the person who looks most kingly isn't necessarily the person most suited to ruling. And so we get God's voice intruding into the narrative. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The inference here, although we may be being harsh on young Eliab, is that he doesn't have the right character to lead. And it's not until Jesse's youngest son David is brought in from the field that Samuel takes the horn of oil and anoints David for kingship. David's character, it seems, is just what God is looking for. Except, of course, if you know what comes next, David's character turns out to be, well, questionable. He was, as they say, a complicated character. There's the cutesy David, the shepherd boy, the talented musician who knows the secret chord that pleases the Lord, Although at the risk of undermining Leonard Cohen's great song, it's not such a secret. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift. I can play that on the guitar, but I digress. Here we have David, the pastoral musical boy wonder, who turns out to be also a capable mixed martial arts fighter, capable of giant killing acts of violence armed with nothing more than a sling and a stone. But then we have David, the adulterer, David the murderer, who by the time of his death has become a kind of mafia boss, visiting death and destruction on those who displease him through a complex family-based network of thugs and agents. This, it turns out, is the Lord's anointed, who, despite us having just been told that the Lord looks not upon appearance, is also, we are told, handsome with a ruddy complexion and beautiful eyes. What is going on that this gorgeous poster boy for the Israelite monarchy 2.0 reboot turns out to be someone who could give Saul a run for his money in the competition of the title for dangerous tyrant of the century? Why is he the anointed one? And here we need to pause for a moment and locate this story within its wider historical context. As with all these early stories from the Hebrew Bible, what we have in our Bibles are texts written much, much later than the events they are describing. These are later stories telling stories that are set in prehistory. It's a bit like 
going to see one of Shakespeare's Henry plays. There's the historical gap between us and Shakespeare, but then there's another historical gap between Shakespeare and the Henry that he's writing about. So it is with this story from 1 Samuel, which was written down during the time of the Babylonian exile, which was at least 500 years after the setting of the stories that it is telling. This is not contemporary, first-hand, eyewitness history of Samuel and Saul and David. This is oral tradition, dramatised and retold over centuries before it eventually gets written down. And when it was written down, it was written down for the Jewish exiles in Babylon. These are people who have just witnessed their capital city of Jerusalem destroyed. They've just seen their king deposed by the invading Babylonians. For these people in exile in Babylon, a story setting the seal of God's approval on the mythic ancestor of their kingly line, rooting that person firmly in the geography of Jerusalem and Judea, this was a compelling narrative of national hope told to sustain them through the experience of the exile. King David, for the exiled Babylonians, functioned in a similar way to King Arthur's role in medieval England. Think about it. The stories of Arthur were set in a mythic prehistory, but they defined what it meant to be English. If you were alive in the Middle Ages, you would hear the stories of Arthur told to set out in narrative form the values of English chivalry, nobility, humility, bravery, obedience. Similarly, for the Israelite exiles in Babylon in the 6th century BC, the story of the mythic King David set five, six hundred years before that time defined for them what it meant for them to be Jewish, setting out the dream of a land, the dream of a king, the dream of a national identity rooted in God's presence in the city of Jerusalem. And just as King Arthur was often portrayed as a complex man, a flawed hero, far from ideal, while still defining the ideal of what it meant to be English. So also for King David, another earlier imperfect, inconsistent character, compelling and repellent in equal measure, far from ideal, but defining the ideal of what it meant to be Jewish. It may not matter to God if David was good looking, but it certainly mattered to the scribe of one Samuel who needed his idealised David, who his audience could fall in love with, before going on to explore the complexities of this great hero's character in the stories that followed. We might say to ourselves that image isn't important, that it's a person's heart and character that matter, not how competently, I don't know, they can eat a bacon sandwich on camera. But the reality of our world, as for the world of the ancient Israelites in exile in Babylon, is that we do like our heroes to look the part, and we expect them to play the part. And as long as they do, we'll overlook all kinds of other moral and personal failings. David was still Israel's hero, despite his tendency towards adultery, murder and violence because he represented an ideal. He was more than the sum of his parts. It doesn't matter whether he even existed, historically speaking. He still wrote the script of what it meant to be Jewish, every bit as effectively as Arthur wrote the script of what it meant to be English. So what are we to make of this? What are we to do with the fact that people continue to acclaim leaders based on appearance rather than character, 
on the ideology they represent rather than the decency of their personality. What are we to make of the fact that we too live in a society where appearance is so often decisive in how a person will be treated by others? From racism, to gender stereotyping, to transphobia, to conspicuous wealth, to a person's weight. In so many ways we judge by appearance and lives are blighted by it. Our new strategic partnership with Impact Dance, the Black-led organisation now based on our fourth floor, together with our strong stance as a church on issues of gender and sexuality, speak well of our openness to going deeper, to valuing each person as made and loved by God. It was inspirational this week for me to be at the public launch of Impact Dance and to hear the testimonies of young people whose lives have been turned around because of the acceptance and value they have discovered there. And I look forward to finding ways as a congregation of journeying with our new partner on our fourth floor as our church and our building are used to embody inclusion and justice. Similarly, I am glad that we are a church where gender and sexuality are no bar to full participation and where we live into being the belief that each of us is created in the image of God. But for all the steps taken, there is a long journey ahead. We need to hear the voice of the Lord breaking into our narratives, telling us that the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. If we can truly hear this message and learn to see people as God sees them, it could be revolutionary for the way we live our lives. Not just in terms of who we vote for in our leaders, although certainly that, but also in the way we are towards one another. God's call is on the people of God to radically reject any narrative or ideology that values or devalues people based on outward appearance. Because God looks to the heart, to a person's character. And it is here that God's persistence is most obvious. As God calls sinful people to repentance, to turn from their selfish ambition and to live lives of love and concern for others. The story we heard from 1 Samuel isn't, in the end, a fable about whether or not we should elect leaders like David. Of course we shouldn't, but of course we do. Rather, it's an invitation for us to see ourselves reflected in the life of David, as we too are flawed human beings, capable of great sin and great goodness, sometimes both at the same time. And if God continued to call David, it was because beneath the flaws of David's character, he was a person who was willing to repent of his evil, to seek forgiveness and to keep seeking the heart of God. And like David, we are called to be continually responsive to the word of God, embodied for us in the word made flesh that is Jesus. It is through Jesus that we are called to a new, a better way of being human to live lives focused on the love of God and the love of each other. People called Jesus the Anointed One, the Messiah, the son of David, born in David's town of Bethlehem. But unlike David, Jesus resisted the temptations of power Jesus turned away from nationalism, from overthrowing the empire. Jesus refused to be king. 
And in so doing, in Jesus, we see the loving heart of God revealed. Because the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. A moment of reflection. So I invite you to take what it is you have heard God saying to you this morning through his word and bring that to bear in your life. And we're going to sing together the hymn who can sound the depths of sorrow in the loving heart of God.
We're now going to be led in our prayers of intercession by Tommaso, who is joining us from Italy, I think. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, as we convene today, we pray that your spirit will lift up and inspire our congregation, helping us reshape our role, our mission, and our contribution to a complex and rapidly changing world. May we resist the temptation of retreating into false certainties and self-serving myths about ourselves. May we be able to do right by the people we meet without looking down on those we disagree with, without neglecting those we cannot see, and without forgetting those who are no longer with us, but left an enduring mark on our lives, on our thinking, and on our spiritual journey. May we realize that each society is a partnership between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born, and fully grasp the foundational character and far-reaching implications of these bonds. As winter is looming and the ongoing pandemic puts our societies under increasing strain, we give thanks for the efforts of all those who are promoting social cohesion through work and volunteering. For we all benefit greatly from their willingness to serve the community and uphold the common good. We are especially grateful to those who are using their talents and skills to meet the collective challenges we face, from viruses to climate change, from poverty to social exclusion, from food scarcity to war. May we acknowledge that our survival hinges and will always hinge upon our ability to find common solutions to common problems and therefore recognize the vital importance of our fellow citizens' perseverance and unflinching commitment to building a better, more sustainable world. We pray for all those who are still wrestling with COVID-19 and other diseases, and especially for those who are more likely to lose faith in our capacity to care for one another, support one another, and being present for one another in these often bewildering times. As we look forward, with a mixture of confidence and anxiety. May we find new ways to reach out to every person who feels estranged, abandoned, betrayed, or even threatened by political and social institutions and offer a glimmer of hope to them for the kingdom of heaven is their kingdom too. We pray for our leaders as we realize that no matter what we do as individuals and private citizens, bold and far-sighted decisions at the top are needed to ensure that the freedom, the welfare, and the dignity of ordinary people all around the world are not written off or impaired. May we appreciate that mistakes made today will have consequences tomorrow, that inaction 
may lead to disaster in the long run. And that plenty of energy and courage will be required to fix any damage caused by our failings, our complacency, and our selfishness. Finally, we pray for ourselves. Loving God, help us receive and share your boundless love with others. Being aware that your calling compels us to question and sometimes break our healthy loyalties and allegiances. That your message transcends time and space, conventional boundaries and established patterns of behavior. May we be able to embrace it with an open and thoughtful mind while we repent of our evil, seek forgiveness, and keep seeking your heart every day. Amen. And so we come now also to dedicate in prayer our giving to God and to the church. Let us pray. Lord God, receive the gifts that we offer before you. Gifts of resources and money. Gifts of time and effort. Gifts of love and hope. We ask that you will bless our giving, that your church will be sustained by it, and that your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. We close by singing together Charles Wesley's great hymn of commitment to discipleship, Forth in your name of God I go.
So go into God's world with love, hope, joy and faith in your hearts. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer, be with us all today and forevermore. Amen.